Let me start off actually with Nick Lardy. Um, at our meeting last year, uh, people were, were very concerned about actually a collapse in the Chinese economy. People were concerned we'd see growth plummeting. Um, it didn't happen. Tell us, tell us why, and then I'll ask Dr. Xu to comment on your comments, and then go to Hi, hi Joe. No, I think you're right. There was a lot of pessimism at the beginning of, of last year, particularly be Speak close to the, yeah, sorry. Uh, in part because of the uh, further stock market correction that was underway at that time, and it, so there was a generalized fear of a, of a hard landing. I think it didn't happen for several reasons. I think, first of all, the consumption-driven growth that we've seen uh, driving China's economy for the last few years continued. We had wage growth. We had growth of disposable income, the growth of private consumption expenditure. According to the Chinese data, uh, in the first three quarters of this year, about 70 percent of economic growth was the result of increased consumption expenditure. That's the highest it's been in about 10 years. So that kind of growth story uh, continued. Similarly, we had continued growth of the service sector. Many people thought that that was going to, to fade away uh, in the wake of the stock market correction. But the service sector is very robust and has a lot of different components and I think performed uh, fairly well uh, in, in 2016. Uh, and the financial crisis that some people thought was coming really didn't materialize. And I think one of the reasons is, yes, debt to GDP continued to go up, but a very large share of the additional credit that was extended last year went to the household sector. About 45 percent uh, of the additional credit was going to the household sector. That compares with about 18 uh, percent just five or six years ago. And so there was a lot of additional credit in the household sector, but household sector debt, that is the debt of households relative to their disposable income, is only at about 70 percent. The U.S. peaked out at a, something like 125 or 130 percent just before the global financial crisis. We're now down to a smaller number, maybe around 100 percent. But China's only at 70 percent. So a very large share of the increased credit was going to the household sector, where the leverage is relatively low, and mortgages are structured in a way that uh, tends to mean the financial risk is, is slow, is low. So I think we did well on the, on the rebalancing, and the financial sector risks were actually diminished last year because the increase in credit to the non-financial corporate sector actually was less last year than it had been in previous years. So the, the deleveraging, I think, is actually uh, getting underway, and, and that hasn't really been noticed properly. Dr. Xu, do you, do you agree with that? And then in addition, what does it mean for 2017? Yeah, OK. Well, uh, sorry. I agree with that. And I don't think that China will collapse uh, in any foreseeable future. Well, you know that uh, extrapolating past trends uh, is a common pitfall in economic forecasting. And I think it is extremely inappropriate in analyzing uh, a prospect in 2017, because we are approaching a turning points, both in the long term and in the short run. And in the long term, you know that in the past several years, China's GDP growth has been falling. Uh, and uh, it is tempting to assume that that downward trend will continue to be there in the next several years. And uh, if you have that kind of prospect, you will be very pessimistic about China's pros uh, economic prospects, because you will you will forecast that China's GDP, GDP growth at the year 2020 may be below 5%, but I don't think so. I believe that uh, China's GDP growth in the next several years will be stabilized around 6.5%, as that is the bottom line of the policymakers in China. You know that the 6.5 is actually a max number. That is the bottom line we should stick to, because we need that the GDP growth to achieve the goal, the so-called welfare society goal we need, that, we need that growth to double GDP by year 2020. And that goal, that wealth, building up welfare society goal, is, uh, I think, a heavy dose of reassurance to everybody. If you have that goal, that people believe that we will have a, some bottom line in the economic performance, they will have confidence in China's prospects, and they will do investment. But if you do not have that 
uh, reassurance, well, people lose faith and you will have easily have self-fulfilling prophecies like China, were cl China collapsing. So I think that despite the heated debate about whether China should stick to the 6.5% GDP growth target, I believe the, the policy makers will make sure that we will have that kind of GDP growth in the next several years. That is so-called the L-shaped bottom. And I think we have already hit that L-shaped bottom. So that means the downward trend in, next, in the past several years will be replaced by a flat trend. It's not very fancy, but I think it's, it's okay. But in the near term, you know, that in the past several quarters, especially in the second half of last year, we see a uh, visible recovery in the real economic growth in China. And uh, we see that uh, various asset prices, like commodity price, has also reflected that. But in the next several quarters, I don't think that a short run, short run upward trend will, will maintain. Uh, because you know that in the, the, the growth momentum in the next, in the last year in China was mainly driven by, revi uh, by the recovery of the property sector. Uh, led by the property investment. And we all know that uh, uh, because of the uh, in sharp increase of the property price, the policymakers have implemented another round of policy control measures to cool down the market. And that has, has, has taken its toll on property investment. Property investment has started to decline. And uh, in, in this year, I don't think that the property price, property, property investment can be as strong as it was in last year. And that will lead to some substantial downward pressures uh, on Chinese economic growth. So I think that this year, my focus for the Chinese GDP growth will be 6.6%. Well, a little bit lower than the 6.7% growth in last year, but, uh, but for a longer run, it's, it's, you, you can quite stabilize. So no collapse, but uh, no sharp recovery. That's, that's my view. Should we care? What the whether it's 6.5 or 6.0 or 5.5 does it really tell me why that matters? Okay, actually, if for a real economy, it's not that important. You know, 6.5, 6.0, just 0.5 percent, no, no big deal. But I said from the, from the perspective of the expectations, it's important. It's then. 6.5% is something we need to anchor the expectations for everybody. If you do not have 6.5% bottom line of the goal, people will think, well, how bad the China economy could be? Nobody knows. And when you have that kind of expectation, but, but you're you saying that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a PR problem, not a real problem. <laughs> that's true. And, uh, and you know, it's, that's it's, a, you're creating an expectation. But shouldn't we care about the quality of the growth? Not what the GDP grows. If you do not have growth, you can't talk about quality. You well, have we're to not have talking the growth, about growth zero. First, then we're you talking talk about, about 5.5 versus. And the, the problem that I always have is when we talk about GDP growth, it's kind of so. It's really the quality of growth. When we, I mean, Nick was focusing on consumption growth and service sector growth. So a point of service sector growth versus one that's investment driven is a lot better for the people of China. Yeah. That's is true. that true? Well, you know that 6.5% GDP growth is important because it is related to welfare of everybody. You need GDP growth to create jobs, to maintain jobs, to create income, to create wages. If you do not have a stabilized GDP growth, you will have massive layoffs. You will have massive bankruptcy. And that is the last thing everybody wants to see. As long as you have stable economic growth, you can have scope to do structural reform hasn't to China's improve the workforce, quality of growth. Hasn't China's workforce peaked? Excuse it, me? Hasn't China's workforce peaked? Isn't it now on the decline? Yeah, we are talking about so the depletion of the demogra demographic dividend. But you know, the demographic changes very slowly. You cannot see meaningful changes in the, on an annual basis, which means it's true that the working age population in China has peaked, but the decline is so slow that you, can, you cannot let the GDP growth fall too much to, you know, that you, you continue to have so, so much people 
needs job. So you need a stabilized growth to make sure that they have they have jobs, they have income. But and what, uh, make sure the social stability. So let, let me poll the panel who know, I mean, you guys know much more about economics than I. Would we be better off focusing on job creation rather than GDP? Would China be better off focusing on job creation rather than GDP growth? Yes or no? Actually, it's hard to do that without a stabilized economic growth. You can, you can see that we can have better job creation with a GDP at, say, 4 or 3 percent. But how to do that? And how can you convince people that you can do that? That's important. Nick? I, well, I, I certainly agree with the premise of your question, Stephen. That is, I think there has been an overemphasis on a GDP growth target in, in the thinking of China's leadership in the top all the way down. I think that there should be more emphasis on improving efficiency, job creation, uh, rising living standards, and so forth. Yes, GDP growth is essential to that, but whether it's 6 or 6.5 or 5.5, uh, I think gets too much attention. Hi, Joe. What do you think about that? Uh, I think that the, um, uh, a growth target like GDP uh, in China or in other countries uh, can be used usefully as a policy coordination tool. I think that's really the key, okay? Um, uh, that's the first point. Secondly, uh, I think that uh, um, uh, there is no contradiction between, uh, in, you know, improving people's wealth, living standard, and uh, growth GDP, uh, in particular for a developing country uh, like China. China's GDP per capita is only at $8,000. Okay, and a lot of people are talking about the so-called uh, middle-income trap. Without a decent GDP growth, China will be falling you know, into middle-income trap. So in that case, uh, I think that uh, uh, you know, growing GDP is important. The target is also very important. Da Jong, anything you want to say on that? Uh, my understanding that it's never uh, carved into the stone that the economy has to grow at a particular percentage point, but uh, government officials at different levels probably expect this uh, so that their performances can be evaluated. As you know, when you are appointed a uh, government official, you are subject to, subjected to evaluation of your performance at least by 19 different criteria, and one of that is uh, the uh, overall GDP growth in your jurisdiction. So you, it's a very different kind of political economy. But at the same time, the quality of jobs is a serious issue, uh, including rising wages, the impact of technology such as automation, and uh, frankly speaking, we face much greater problems than here in the United States. And, and, and I, one of the things like, that led to what Mr. Shiga was saying is that if you look at the, on an annual basis, how many college graduates we send to the market, it's nearly between six and seven million each year. And that's a lot of people who want, who need jobs. And mm -hmm. as you know, a lot of these fresh graduates uh, either for lack of experience or just different expectations, they keep changing jobs. It's a very dynamic situation. So um, if I can summarize, it's that you have that demand for cre job creation. You also have that political necessity for government officials to compete with each other saying, look, I have delivered high growth. And that drives up. It's a politi politics driven growth, should I say. Hi, Joe. Every year, we always look forward to your prediction on the Chinese stock market. Um, and I, I, know, I see Jan van Eck is not here, but a few years ago, he created his ETF on China's A-share market. And um, after hearing Hi, Joe, I went out and bought some, and it paid for a few dinners for the Orleans family as a result. But tell us what your, uh, what, how the market has performed this past year. Uh, what we should look for this coming year. And we heard talk of a, a 
uh, decoupling. Is there a decoupling of the Chinese, the Chinese stock market from the Chinese economy? Okay. Um, um, I think that, uh, um, first of all, I want to comment on China's economy. Then I will comment on the China's market. And then basically, hopefully, we'll provide some uh, you know, uh, suggestions about where the market will be going. Uh, I think that Lee uh, make a very important point uh, in his uh, remarks about uh, why last year, you know, uh, China, China's economy didn't clap and uh, there was too much worry about the uh, financial crisis and so on and so forth. Indeed, the, the economy was doing quite well. Um, if you think about, I, I keep pointing out uh, a few reasons. Uh, I, I agree with him on, on those reasons, including consumption growth and the credit growth and so on and so forth. If we put China into global stage, I think that the last year is very interesting. Uh, in a way that uh, last year, remember that there was one emerging market economy uh, that didn't have a president for three quarters. It's the equity market that went out index 50%. Its currency went out 40% against the US dollar. That country is called Brazil. Another country had a coup. The president almost got killed. Doesn't matter. The equity market went up, the, the currency went up. So, so in a way that, uh, uh, in that context, yeah, that's, that country is called Turkey, okay? Uh, <laughs> Turkey is still in trouble so just, to some extent. So we will see how the Turkey, Turkish stock market will be performing this year. So in a, in a way that I think that uh, in addition to the reasons uh, Nick pointed out, I think there's also a very important reason globally, which is uh, I think that the Fed, Federal Reserve, of course, uh, holds its power. The uh, so Fed only hiked interest rate once. Uh, in December, and uh, so there was a lot of liquidity into emerging market as a whole. So globally, if you think about the two key parameters that really, I would say, save the emerging market, I think that is the Fed that did not hike interest rate as aggressive as uh, people worried at the very beginning, and that is China, credit growth and, uh, and uh, China's consumption growth. China's PPI turning positive in uh, September, that's a really very important event. Uh, for, glo for, for global economy, not just China. So from strategy perspective, if, if I would think about two, uh, two parameters that, uh, that anchored last year's global economy, is the Fed's policy de decision, high interest rate once, and China's PPI turning into positive in September. Those, let's, let's keep those in mind. So that's really the key. And with that, of course, you know, China's economy was doing rather well, and the China's market stabilized, okay? Uh, if I want to go to China's um, uh, economy for this year, I think that uh, our own marketing's uh, view is that uh, uh, China's GDP growth rate for uh, uh, 2017 um, will be somewhere around 6.7%, okay? Uh, so in a way that uh, we don't see that uh, in the short run, there was a problem as uh, Dr. Xu pointed out. We, we, we think that uh, credit growth uh, w will be more or less zero, and uh, despite uh, that the investment into equity market uh, would decline somewhat, the key is not about investment into equity market, it's about the consumption growth that the NIC has been emphasized over the last few years. 73% uh, contribution from consumption growth, that is going to, co to continue to be there. Meanwhile, corporate profit will continue to improve with the PPI uh, turning positive in September. Our, call, our, our market team's call for PPI for China into 2017 is 3.6%. Uh, With that, I think that the bank's profitability will improve. Corporates, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, manufacturing sectors uh, uh, profit will improve. So that's why that uh, we we think that uh, this year, 2017, uh, China's Asia market uh, would be, uh, uh, we think, it, uh, could be one of the better market among emerging market. Okay. So I think that uh, if uh, you know, for that reason, I think that it's time to, uh, to to uh, to to you know, to 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 invest into the Asia market. Uh, uh, our U.S. office CEO, uh, Elena Roche, is sitting here, and uh, she can help us. Anyone want to open kind of with CICC? We're happy to do that. Thank you. <laughs> you, you. You talked about one of the factors being the Fed not raising rates aggressively last year. And if you look at the, meet, the, 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 the notes on the most recent meeting, uh, they're talking about very aggressively raising rates this coming year, despite the uncertainty created by the president-elect's economic policies. Is that going to be a uh, cap on A share prices? Uh, rising PPI would be a key thing for China. Fed's hiking interest rate would not hurt that, if anything, okay? 
So I think that uh, with the rising interest rate uh, uh, globally, I mean, led by the US, two economies would benefit, uh, financial markets, I think, two financial markets would benefit more from that. One is the United States, and the second is China. The other economy, we can spend a lot of time talking about that, but it's not very clear, okay? Uh, I, I, so so for, for that reason, uh, we are uh, you know, optimistic about the US market, and we are also optimistic about the China's market. Nick, what do you think about the, the Fed's policy affecting real growth? Uh, you know, assuming that we see two, three, potentially even four rate increases this coming year, what do you think about its effect on China's real economy? And then same question for Dr. Xu. Well, this is a complicated subject. I think that um, the rising U.S. interest rates will represent a will represent a challenge for China. I think it will certainly show up in the currency markets. I think China is moving into a period where management of its exchange rate uh, is more challenging. So if there's a, going to be an effect, I would think it would be coming primarily through, uh, through the exchange rate uh, channel. Uh, so I think as U.S. interest rates go up, uh, China will face a challenge either allowing more capital outflows or having to raise interest rates uh, domestically, which could be adverse for their for, for their economic growth. So I think it will, it, it will be a, a more challenging aspect than we saw last year where, when you said the Fed was not uh, moving so much. Dr. Xi? Well, pe now people are forecasting that uh, the Speak Fed will... directly into... Uh, it's hard to... Uh, uh, now people are forecasting that the Fed will tighten monetary policy more aggressively than it, will, than it did in last year. But uh, I may have a different opinion about that because you know, people believe that the more t uh, tightening monetary policy because the uh, president-elect Trump uh, uh, is going to do expansionary fiscal policy to boost aggregate demand in the United States. But I think that the, what the President Trump will do uh, doesn't add up because on one hand, he's going to do use expansionary fiscal policy. On the other hand, he wants to uh, shrink the uh, uh, balance of payment uh, deficit, uh, a current account deficit uh, of the United States. But you know that uh, uh, if you cannot uh, borrow money, borrow capital from the international capital market, which means that you, are, you have a shrinking uh, current account uh, deficit, the where, where can you, how can you fund your expansionary fiscal policy? The expansion of uh, fiscal policy will have crowning out effect on the, on the U.S. economy. That's what I fear. So I don't think that uh, uh, from, this, from this perspective, I don't think that uh, uh, the, I, I fr I'm afraid that the, the, what the President Trump is going to do may not have that big impact on the U.S. economy as most people expect in nowadays. And uh, when that expectation turns out, turns out uh, uh, to, to, to the other side, I think that the uh, Fed will under pressure to, uh, to slow down the, tightening, the pace of monetary tightening. And uh, I think that will have a meaningful impacts on various uh, asset classes. This all sounds pretty optimistic. You know, we're talking about 6.7, 6.5%. If you read the U.S. media and you talk to a lot of U.S. companies that are investing in China, they might not agree with this analysis. Um, we clearly are seeing, whether you call it a tightening of the ability to uh, export capital from China, or whether they're enforcing existing rules or they're putting in place new rules is a subject of debate. But there is no question that it's more difficult to get dollars out of China today. And there's enormous pressure, despite the last few days or the last two weeks, we've seen some uh, RMB appreciation. As a general trend, there's enormous pressure on the RMB to, depre uh, to depreciate. Um, if your analysis is right, why? Why, is there the, why does the market seem to see things differently from uh, what I'm hearing on the panel today? That's uh, because expectations. You know, in, during the second half of year 2014 to the first quarter of year 2015, 
the U.S. dollar uh, appreciated by 25% in terms of U.S. index. And in, the net, in that, during that time, you don't see any meaningful depreciation pressures faced by RMB. But right after the uh, uh, 811 uh, fixed reform in, last, uh, in year 2015, we see substantial depreciation uh, pressures. Actually, from the first quarter of year 2015 to nowadays, the U.S. dollar appreciate in a, in a broader term only by 5%. And in the meantime, RMB depreciate against the U.S. dollar by more than 10%. And I don't think that depreciation pressures is, is strongly related to the economic fundamental. I think that people, that's because people lose faith in the stability of the RMB exchange rate. And they, they try to front run the PBOC who, who's, who is assumed to let, to let go of the RMB exchange rate. So that's why we need the, a harsher uh, capital, capital account uh, control to cool down the expectation, uh, ex uh, depreciation expectations. That's why expect expectation is so important. And uh, you know that, as, although we are, we, are, we are tightening the capital control, but you know that the borrowing money from the, uh, so lending out to the international market, you can do it either by the current account surplus or by uh, capital account. And uh, you know that we can still help uh, US, uh, US economy to, to, to revive by providing more goods to the United States. And uh, I think that's what the United States need. The other panelists agree with that? It's just expectations? There's nothing fundamentally going on? Well, I should, I should be clear. It is, of course, related to, to the economic fundamental. But the most important thing, I think, in terms of RMB exchange rate movements in recent years is expectation. But all the other countries where you saw significant depreciation vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. I'm not aware of many imposing capital controls. Is that the right policy? Well, Nick, you may be the only one yeah. free to answer that question. <laughs> no. Well, I, I, uh, I tend to agree with what Justin said in his remarks, I think uh, you want to have a, you, you want to have a relatively stable currency, and when you're under uh, significant uh, pressure on outflows, it's appropriate uh, to increase temporarily uh, uh, the degree of control, either by enforcing previously existing uh, mechanisms that had been overlooked, or by by possibly adding new ones. I don't think it's a fundamental change in long-term Chinese policy about having a more flexible exchange rate. And I think part of the problem is that the central bank has moved towards an explicit, explicit policy of managing the currency with respect to a basket. And that move, I think, coincided with this huge strength in the US dollar. So if you look at what's been happening to the Chinese currency against its basket, it's been relatively stable but it's depreciated quite a bit against, uh, bilaterally uh, against the dollar. Uh, and you can see that because many, many other currencies, as you mentioned, Steve, have depreciated significantly in recent months uh, and quarters. So China's actually a bit of an outlier. So what we're really seeing today is stability, relative stability vis-a-vis -vis the basket and significant depreciation against the dollar, which in, in large part reflects uh, very substantial, unprecedented strength of the dollar yeah, in recent months. Hi, Joe. Da Jung, you want to add anything to the effectiveness of capital controls? Uh, if you think about the, uh, the dollar versus other currencies, um, you know, uh, say dollar versus uh, emerging market currencies over the last two and a half years, uh, basically emerging market currency as a whole, the in if you think about it, some kind of index, depreciate against dollar by about 40% for the last two and a half years. Uh, since uh, November, I think that the emerging market, market currency in general depreciated against dollar by 10%, okay? So, so in that regard, I think that the next point is, you know, uh, is very important, which is that uh, why RMB is, uh, you know, uh, depreciated little, very little against US dollar. 
RMB actually, if you measure it against the emerging market basket, strengthened it enormously against that basket. So that so that is where we are. I think this is a very important point to keep that in mind. So, Dr. Zhong, anything you want to add on that one? No. I mean, I, I would say we've heard about confidence being an issue, and we've heard about the depreciation, emerging market currencies depreciating vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. And I would argue the responsible, that, that if I'm sitting there in China with the need to um, use dollars abroad, that the imposition of capital controls incentivizes me to move more quickly. Mm and puts more pressure on the RMB. And policies like that actually are counterproductive if you want a stable currency and decreases confidence in the Chinese currency. We're not only, we're not only seeing that pressure, we're also seeing, Dajong, this is a question for you, we're, we're seeing both U.S. and non-U.S. firms, um, which had been pouring money into China through FDI, decreasing. What's going on there and what, what policies should be adopted in order to get that flow going strong again? Some of the uh, explanation for the slowing down of FDI into China has to do with structural factors such as uh, rising wages. And also, uh, you, you see more and more Chinese companies themselves relocating to Vietnam, to Laos, to Burma, Southeast Asia. and. Uh, there are some sectors in the Chinese economy that probably ought to be more open to foreign direct investment, such as in uh, telecom or you know, um, the energy business, telecommunications, or even banking. But those areas remain contentious in terms of opening. But I would think uh, I'm not a uh, financial expert. Overall, the Slowing down of FDI into China is a reflection of a combination of structural elements in the Chinese market and also the uh, part of the regional economy whereby you have uh, Chinese themselves going out. But then the real issue here is whether or not be uh, this American or Japanese, whoever else, this capital that flows into China in, in the form of FDI rather than carry trade. There are a lot of carry trade that takes advantage of the exchange rates of what you said about expectation management, uh, especially in, the, uh, in relation to the housing sector in China. Um, I would think the bottom line in terms of greenfield or brown, brownfield FDI is whether or not these companies uh, make a decent profit as is in line with uh, Chinese laws and uh, or that in line with their expectations or assessments of what they ought to be making in the Chinese market. If you're sitting in Zhongnanhai, what external threats on the economic side worry you the most? What could really, so we're saying, okay, there seems to be consensus up here, maybe with me accepted, that we're gonna be between 6.5 and 6.7% growth. Um, what external factors might affect that and what policies can be adopted to mitigate those threats? And I'll just go down the, the panel and, and ask, start with uh, Hi Joe. 
Well, uh, first of all, I don't see it in Jonah High, so that's just a, it's a question, but I try to answer <laughs> that question. Yeah. No, we, we advertise uh, this as yeah. the Jungnan High panel. Know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. If we're sitting in New York Stock Exchange, I think we'll think about the market. Uh, I think that uh, uh, in terms of the uh, growth uh, for the China's economy, uh, you know, as Nick mentioned, uh, much of the growth now uh, is re rebalanced towards consumption. So in a way, China will need to focus on its own uh, economy. That's really the key. Uh, you know, support the consumption growth, and uh, meanwhile, support a, a certain level of GDP growth rate in, in through uh, credit growth and uh, investment growth, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, China also, that uh, in terms of the external factor you, you mentioned, I think that, uh, uh, you know, to what extent the, uh, you know, the Fed would hike interest rate, that certainly is an important factor. Uh, so that would affect the exchange rate, and uh, that would probably would, would have implications on capital outflows and uh, and also on China's own domestic monetary policy, whether, you know, to what extent the monetary policy will need to respond to that. Uh, 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 in addition to those, I think that China can handle this through, for example, uh, domestic reform. If China can implement effective, uh, you know, uh, domestic reforms, then basically that return on capital in China will, will rise, and the return on investment would be improving, and the, and the corporate profit, profitability would improve. Stock market would you know would would, would perform or outperform other markets. So then I think that uh, uh, many many parameters can change and uh, in China's favor uh, in a way that uh, you know including that the capital outflows uh, could become capital inflows. Okay, and then uh, FDI the the issue you raise in China could attract more uh, FDI. So let's say that uh, if if China would implement uh, uh, you know effective uh, reform. You know, China has been implementing reform and improving that. That I think that uh, uh, you know they, they is is uh, I think it's still hopeful that, uh, for example, China's Asia will be included in MSCI index this year, and that and given that uh, you know uh, China has just launched the Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect, uh, I think that uh, that that could uh, you know really uh, uh, you know attract the additional international capitals into China, and uh, so that would help. Nick. I, well, I think the biggest external risk is a, a trade war, rising protectionism in the United States. Uh, if President-elect Trump does even a small fraction of the things he's claimed he's going to do, uh, and China feels uh, compelled to retaliate uh, in in one form or another, uh, there's the, you know a downward spiral uh, in the in China's external trade, particularly with the United States, which is one of its biggest markets, uh, could have a substantial uh, negative effect on on its growth. So I think management of the relationship uh, in, in the coming months and quarters is going to be uh, critical. Uh, I do think that uh, we'll get some information on this fairly early in the new, uh, the new administration, but if we're heading in that direction, uh, I think we can downgrade China's growth outlook. By the way, I didn't sign up for 6.5 to 6.7. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a significant, whatever you think the number otherwise would be, you can take off uh, a point or two if uh, a trade war uh, with its largest trading partner uh, comes to pass. Okay. Um, Dr. Xi. Well, despite all the pessimistic views about China, I believe that Chinese policymakers still have ample room and abundant ammunition to maintain a stable growth. But as, as China has already be so deeply integrated into the world economy. There's, there's no way that China can isolate any external shocks. And in my views, I think the most, uh, the biggest risks uh, China faced in, in this year, external shocks uh, facing there is, is related to the uncertainties of the United States policies. You know, in my eyes, I think that the president elect like Trump likes to take some surprising moves. So if, if president, President Trump surprises everybody in a bad way, I think that will have a huge impacts um, not only on China, but also on the United States and the world economy. So I think that's the biggest risk faced by the Chinese economy in this year. Na Zhong, you asked me if I were in Tung Nan Hai. <laughs> okay, I'm not there, but... I would think... Uh, I know you're only there Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Right. <laughs> uh, I would think uh, I see three risks structurally. One, it, it's not just what President Trump 
might do once he's in office. He has to do something to uh, live up to his tough China rhetoric. It's more the demonstration effect on Europe, on Japan, and on Southeast Asia. It's this whole endorsement of trade diversion, as was uh, written into the TPP negotiations. TPP was not about trade creation, was a trade about was about trade diversion. Now that philosophy is accepted. So China is stuck at a stage whereby its position in the uh, international value chain of products is rather tentative. And uh, our political relationships with our neighbors are not that good. So it's not just a 5% or 8% whatever China specific tariff coming from uh, Washington is more the demonstration effect. That's point one. A second risk related to what your earlier question about why foreign companies are investing less in China, that's the notion of uh, investment reciprocity. Um, you have uh, difficulties in neg negotiations between China and the United States towards a bilateral investment treaty or uh, if some Chinese came up with the idea of uh, doing a bilateral investment agreement first, those were not moving. We have had tremendous difficulties negotiating towards similar arrangements with the European Union. And then, frankly speaking, the, uh, on, the, on the Chinese side as well, you have a uh, sort of growing sense of unwillingness, quote unquote, to yield to foreign demand and you know the WTO or what else, these multilateral institutions are not being very useful. And then you, this goes back to what we said earlier on about the expectation management, capital moving in and out, but is this really uh, creating new jobs or really new products or it's just more of a financial service. So the last point related to this, I hope, I understand most of you are you know, business folks rather than us academics. Uh, if I think about the pendulum swings in assessing China's prospects, at one quarter it's going to be up, another quarter it's going to be down, there is a structural side to this. In terms of uh, uh, amassing, analyzing, projecting China's economic data, we still are in a strange situation whereby you have the second largest economy of the world managed by GDP terms, but China still remains to be pretty much a club of one. That's, that it's a club of itself. We are not really associated with OECD. We have some working level relationship with IMF and World Bank, Chinese, the provision of data by Chinese sources or analysis is often treated with skepticism. And that kind of skepticism itself uh, invites a lot of these, I mean, drives a lot of pendulum swings. So I would think uh, down the road, we ought to be working towards a uh, more uh, um, harmonization, should I say, about economic data gathering and analysis about China, rather than now you sort of have a parallel set of data and analysis. Why in what the Chinese say, when what you think you ought to be believing. Although that does create good business for many of these, uh, you know, consultancies. <laughs> so that I see those three risks. I'm surprised that there's not more discussion of the heightened geo geopolitical risk to the Chinese economy from external factors, that for the first time in many years, we've seen the Taiwan issue. Mm -hmm. We've seen increased tension after eight full years of decreasing tension. We've seen a reduction, a massive reduction in Chinese tourism to China. You're looking at 40% at, at drop, which is very significant. We've seen heightened um, concern about North Korea with an in increasing possibilities of major disruption 
uh, coming out of North Korea. We're seeing increased tension in the South China Sea. Uh, we've seen Chinese actions uh, interpreted by both the current administration and the transition team uh, as being very aggressive, uh, unprecedented, and potentially disruptive. Um, and it seems to me that this year we need to think about those issues and think about ways that we decrease that risk, that in a lot of ways we return it to 2016 or 2015 where those risks were, certainly in the case of the South China Sea and Taiwan, were, were lower. I mean, Dajong, don't you see heightened geopolitical risk this year? Uh, I work on some of the issues, especially South China. <laughs> that's why I'm asking you. So I'm not that's, here. That's on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and then you yes. rest on Sunday. So I'm not here to explain or justify or defend or whatever positions. Uh, also, I, again, I understand this is a business situation. The narrative about the tensions has a life of its own. You have uh, a version outside China, you have a version that's in China. Increasingly, those versions are becoming so divergent. Um, but you, if you really come back to, to looking at what's really going on on the ground, uh, Steve noted some of the things. Uh, there is not really that much that really ought to be causing concern. The folks from the mainland Taiwan continue to talk to each other, and that's very important in managing the uh, dynamics. And politicians, you know, you have this popular reason. It's not just here in the United States. It's over there on the Taiwan island. Frankly speaking, it's over there in China, and in a very powerful way. A lot of folks feel, you know, People in Dongnan High have a button on just about every issue, but often our decision making at the top level is also being hijacked by this harsh rhetoric. And often that rhetoric, when it's expressed in Chinese in a language that's different from English, it's difficult for you folks to understand. Uh, but I would not count North Korea as a, uh, as a major geopolitical problem and because uh, the bottom line of North Korean demand is for the United States to recognize North Korea as a, uh, to basically to establish a formal diplomatic relationship with North Korea. And I doubt that the North Koreans would do anything to disrupt uh, South Korea or scare the United States by firing anything into the waters of Hawaii <laughs> or West Coast. <laughs> but there is a serious message here. I do see a challenge for the professional groups, both over there in China and here in the United States, to relate more to each other, and that's horizontally and <coughs> vertically. We ought to be doing more uh, to inform the policy makers, and frankly speaking, to temper some of, to help temper down <coughs> some of these, uh, should I say, uh, tendency to hype the situation by our think tanks, both over there in China and here in the United States. Um, that's why we are here. And for you folks, professionals, say you, the chambers of commerce, you know, the investors, um, you have a choice. You can say, okay, I'm gonna watch and duck the bullets, or you can say, well, I have a stake in here. I'm going to uh, have my voice heard rather than just um, writing, uh, contributing to this oversimplification of a so-called geostrategic gamesmanship. Let me put it that way. Thank you. Right, I'm going to open, before opening the, the floor to questions, we have a very distinguished group here. Let me ask one final question, and you can 
choose one or the other. Either you're in the White House or you're in Zhongnanhai, but you only have 60 seconds to either tell President Xi or tell, at that point, President Trump um, what they should do to improve the U.S.-China economic relationship. So they've only given you 60 seconds. I won't, they've given you 60 seconds. So, hi, Joe. Okay, I'll be happy to tell President Trump. Oh, you uh, want to tell, you're choosing President Trump. Okay. Well, they are, yeah, <laughs> because I, I don't live in Zhongnanhai, I don't live in White House, so, but anyway, yeah. I think that uh, the- um, It's easier to get into Zhongnanhai. Uh, yeah, well, I, I also can get into White House, okay. <laughs> and I live for that way, yeah. Uh, I think that the, the uh, uh, U.S.-China uh, uh, relationship is vital. This is the number one, number two economy of the world. And uh, uh, China, of course, that uh, uh, continue to grow, even at, say, let's say, six, six and a half, seven percent, whatever growth rate. Uh, China's wealth creation per year, I mean, um, every year, is three times the United States. Uh, I mean, China's rebalance more into consumption growth, as Nick pointed out. So that's going to create enormous investment opportunities for U.S. corporations and for the world, and that's really, really important. So the, in terms of economic relationship for the United States, the most relationship, most important relationship rests on U.S.-China economic relationship. No other country can match that, and that's very, very important. Nick, well, I think well, just- Which do you choose? I'm, uh, I'm going to the White House. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry? <laughs> I didn't hear. White House. I would agree with uh, what Hajo said about the, the critical importance of the bilateral economic relationship both to the United States and to China, but also to the global economy. And I think I would make the argument that the best single step to improve that relationship with the associated benefits would be to conclude the bilateral investment treaty that's, that's been right. under negotiation for uh, so many years. After all, the president-elect has said he's in favor of bilateral relationships that are good, bilateral agreements that are good for the United States. Maybe he doesn't like some of the multilateral ones. That's a separate issue. Uh, but this is this would be an enormous uh, game changer. It would improve the climate. Uh, it would be very positive for China's domestic growth because it would open up the service sector, uh, and it would be very uh, very important for U.S. companies and job creation indirectly in the United States as well. Dr. Xu. Okay. Well, I will say that um, uh, Are you in Zhongnanhai or the White House? Maybe in White House. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to talk to President Xi. I'll take President Xi. <laughs> I, I, will tell, I will talk to, to President Trump that to maintain a stable and healthy relationship between China and the United States is the best interest of our both nations. And in some sense, we, may, we might be competitors, but there are a lot, there are even more scope that we can work together to make the world a, be a better world. That's what I say. Um, Professor Jia, Zhongnanhai or White House? This is to the Zhongnanhai, how does that sound? Um, I would think it would be very useful for the, Ch the Chinese leadership to issue a public and open invitation for the Trump administration to join the ARIV, the Asian in Infrastructure Investment Bank. This is a good gesture that ought to be forthcoming. And secondly, uh, just to echo Nick's point, I would think the Chinese government can be better off by making clearer and making a public campaign that it does want to have an early conclusion of the uh, bilateral investment treaty negotiations and make the case beyond just the uh, negotiators and say, we are ready, we want to conclude, and there are, we're serious about implementing this. And uh, we cannot just emphasize that the bilateral relationship is important, it's complex, it's consequential. Well, we just ought to be doing things that give ourselves a sense of confidence that things can be moving ahead in a positive way, no matter how tiny, uh, how baby step each uh, of those can be. I guess I would choose President Xi to talk with. And I, and I, would, I would say, um, 
The perception is reform is stalled. And it's important for both the Chinese people and the American people to understand that there's progress still being made. And you should do what President-elect Trump has done, which is go around the traditional media and speak directly to the people yes. yeah. and speak directly to the American people. And whether it's done through an interview, through traditional media, or just directly, but explain to the American people what he seeks to accomplish and what he wants U.S.-China relations to do for the world. Let me open the floor to, uh, to questions. TK. Uh, President-elect uh, Trump has appointed Peter Navarro to be his chief advisor on China and trade. Now, Peter Navarro is uh, best known for his books, Death by China, The Coming China Wars. Uh, but at the same time, he is uh, one, a member of your profession. He's an economist, has a PhD from Harvard, professor at University of California. So. You know, some of that, it must be rhetoric uh, because he has run unsuccessfully for political office. So if we separate the economist from the politician, you know, just as an economist, what do you think of his uh, articles, his ideas on VAT as an economist? You know, separate that. And then secondly, as a politician and government, future government official, his uh, possible influence. Whoever wants to answer. Not all at once. <laughs> Nick? Well, I don't, I don't know uh, Professor Navarro. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think there's much credibility to anything that he's written about China. Uh, it seems to be uh, highly fictionalized. And I, I really worry that somebody like him with, with such a weak factual base, a realistic understanding of what's going on on the ground in terms of the bilateral economic relationship, that somebody like that could be in a position of influencing uh, policy making. I think it's extremely dangerous. Any of our Chinese want to comment on that? Uh, I would agree with Nick. Um, I also think that if you think about uh, uh, from China's perspective, uh, leading uh, economists on, on China, uh, a number of them are sitting here, Nick, uh, um, Barry sitting there, and uh, so, so I think that uh, um, uh, before he ran election, I never heard of him, so I'm sorry about that, okay? Uh, but in, so I think that uh, uh, his analysis on, on China, to me, uh, you know, if you think about it through, through high uh, academic standard, I think that probably it's, it's, not, that, it's, it's not good, okay? Uh, um, in terms of his influence on policy, I don't know. We have to wait and see. Well, as a professor, he can say anything he wants. Like, I'm, I'm a professor myself. We are often <laughs> behind the curve. But when he's in government position, he has to be thinking about a lot of other issues. And, uh, you know, the Chinese certainly have uh, their two or set in terms of responding to whatever comes. But that's not a desirable situation. Uh, if I had a word to, uh, um, I, I think that there is a bigger structural problem here. You see the National Trade Council, that's new, the National Economic Council, even the National Security Council of, yeah. of the United States. We don't have corresponding agencies in China to relate to them. And we don't have this kind of just simple consultation back and forth. It would be uh, far more productive and useful for us to, rather than just speculating or commenting on Professor Navarro, you know, he's a um, patriot. He serves his country in the best way he thinks he can. We should respect that. But the more productive way is for the Chinese to come up with a mechanism to relate to his institution, and uh, if we don't have a ready institution like that in China, we ought to be making it clear 
to uh, the new uh, administration in the White House and also the new Congress, why things are such. Uh, the last thing when these sort of things happen, the transition happens, is for this perception or misperception to be reinforced here in the United States, that the, somehow China or the Chinese appear to be uh, unscrutable or uh, either aloof or insensitive to American uh, commentaries, uh, however informed those commentaries are. But I can assure you, should there be, uh, uh, should there be policy actions that are seem to be out of the whack, the Chinese know how to retaliate. Back here. Hi, uh, I'd like your views on uh, another member of the administration, not Navarro, but uh, Robert Lighthizer, who uh, does not seem to live in a fictional world, and he's actually won anti-dumping cases. If you start from the premise that Trump has to deliver something on trade, and you think about the range of things, anti-dumping, tariffs, what have you, what kind of measures would not, uh, might give him something to claim victory without upsetting the relationship, and what kind of measures would start having a serious impact on, on the bilateral relationship? Can you kind of talk about the range of steps and the, the consequences from them? We've been through this again and again. This goes back actually to the mid-1990s. If you recall, uh, then Premier Zhu Rongji came to this country, tried to explain um, the uh, trade deficit or the trade surplus on the Chinese side. And subsequently, you had a uh, bilateral commission between the two governments to investigate what contributed to the uh, a trade surplus, a deficit. China, you know, if you understand the value chain argument, an iPhone that's made in China, marked as made in China, actually you have about six or seven out of the uh, two hundred dollars value that's actually created in China. Although by WTO rules, the country of origin is still marked as China, right? And that's why we need to go back to rule-based uh, management of bilateral ties. And with each of and every of these American campaigns, rhetoric has to go uh, a little bit of extreme to get the votes. And like I said earlier, I want to reiterate, is that sometimes on our side over there in China, we don't seem to appreciate the level of complexity or agonization that's going on, or complexity in the American society. We ought to be making a bigger <clears throat> effort to relate to different segments of the American society in order to carry out rather than just say, hey, you do this, I retaliate that way. Over here. Thank you, Richard Black, uh, Executive Intelligence Review. Immediately after uh, President-elect uh, Trump's uh, uh, election, President Xi called to congratulate uh, the President-elect and uh, uh, Mr. Trump said, uh, I am impressed with the eye-popping infrastructure that your nation is involved in. He's, he has appointed uh, Governor Barnstead of Iowa, a longtime friend of President Xi, to be ambassador to China. And our information is that uh, our people in the United States at NASA are extremely excited about the possibility of working with China in their absolutely frontier work in space. So my question would be, what would be the uh, drawback for people on the panel to look in terms of a perspective of bringing the United States into the Belt and Road Initiative? To think big. Mr. Trump likes to think big. Think out of the box. Is this a possibility? <laughs> uh for the U.S. to get into the AIIB would be a serious a step to get into the so-called Belt and Road scheme. Uh, you have to remember the Belt and Road, it's three years old, and uh, it's more a vision. We don't have a blueprint. It's very difficult or impossible to 
pinpoint a project in China and say this is the Belt and Road project, that's not. And it's more an analogy. And uh, so I can spend a lot of time talking about it. You, you also very critically important to remember it's the Europeans. It's the German companies, including HP, you know, the Hewitt Packard, that makes a lot of these computer parts in Chengdu, that uh, started to make use of the uh, uh, railway connecting Lianyuangang to Duisburg, Germany. So it's not so uniquely Chinese. It's not exclusive. It cannot be. What's the Belt and Road? The instrument is very simple. It's actually trade and investment. And as I go around Southeast Asia and talk to them, it's an open invitation on the table. You take it or leave it. You have to contribute. There's no Marshall Plan. We don't bail anybody out. And much of the language in the Belt and Road, the so five areas of connectivity, it borrows from the World Bank and others. And if I can give a little bit of a philosophical take to it, for China to propose this Belt and Road idea to Central Asia, to West Asia, to North Africa today, the philosophy is exactly the same as the United States and Japan, Europe went to China in the early 1990s. You try to nurture a new market of demand. You try to create customers that would eventually buy your products. And in the volatile geostrategic setup today, who are we to say that these people in those poor places, those volatile places, don't deserve a shot at the prosperity. So don't look at the Belt and Road as something so uniquely Chinese and something that's so anti-West. It's something, if you re, re, buy into my analogy of saying, for China to advocate doing infrastructure, whatever project in Sri Lanka or you know, any of these places, or one of these stands in Central, it's, it's Central Asia, don't like to hear that, one of the stands. Sorry about it. Uh, in Central Asia, it's just exactly the same as American companies that refused to give up on China some 40 years back. Um, so the last point, that we, which is not really a, a, a minor point, is that the United States is on the Belt Road. Why? How can China do anything if we lose our trade and investment relation with the United States. How did we come to this stage of time? It's because we had access, we had you know, the uh, opportunity to access capital, technology, and the consumer markets across the Pacific. So for the Belt and Road idea to flourish a stable relationship uh, with the United States, with the North American market, is very critical. The United States is on the Belt and Road, and I would think the, uh, uh, if you just look at it as a way of generating new demand, generating new consumer base, just join us and let's go do it together. I and the Chinese government has signed framework arrangements with the government of France in reaching out to uh, Franco Africa. We have signed agreements with the Portuguese speaking countries collaborate, and of course with Britain. This was before Brexit. We, have, we are even working with South Korea in developing what's called third party markets. Why don't we do that with the United States? English, my English is very horrible, but you know, I'm one of those more deplorables. But English being such a universal language, you guys have a natural uh, capacity to do it and uh, show us the way rather than just, don't just sit there and observe. Go to those places in the same spirit you came to China when our society had barely finished the Cultural Revolution. Right, just time for one short question. Oh, I'm sorry, I went too long. Um, when the Japanese asset bubbles blew up 25 years ago, um, the Japanese economy never collapsed, but arguably, you know, it decelerated sharply after that, um, arguably because of, uh, one of the reasons is because of misallocation of capital. The, the Japanese government put pressure on the Japanese banks to continue to lend to the so-called zombie companies. If you look at China today, arguably there's zombie companies in China that are called state-owned enterprises. 
and they employ over 60 million people. And so my question to you is, is um, could the Chinese government um, do the same sort of mistakes, and that is keep a lot of the state-owned enterprises afloat, and eventually you have a capital misallocation and a real ratcheting down in your long-term potential growth rate? Who wants to take that? Nick? Well, I'm, uh, it's possible that scenario could play out, but I think it's very unlikely, and uh, my main reason, and this draws uh, on uh, Dr. Lin's work, I think China is relatively poor today compared to where Japan was when the bubble burst. Japan, China today, in per capita PPP terms, is roughly where Japan was in the mid-1950s. It's nowhere near where Japan was when the bubble burst. And if you believe, to some, even to some extent, in the idea of convergence, China has a long way to go to catch up with, with the frontier. And uh, so I think that means the potential for growth in China today is much higher than it was in Japan when the bubble burst. Uh, and uh, just as a footnote, I would say, yeah, there are a lot of zombie companies in China, but total employment in state companies is only about 45 million. It's 10% of the labor force. Some s fraction of that, presumably a fairly small fraction, is zombie companies. So the restructuring challenge that China faces is politically huge, but in economic terms, I don't think it's, I, I think it's manageable. Please join me in thanking the panelists for putting themselves in the White House and Jim Nyhart.